look, smart contracts are, I think it almost seems cliche and kind of pointless to say this, but like uh, most of the value in blockchain, I think comes from smart contract platforms. I think that that much is clear. You know, there's smart contracts on Bitcoin now, <laughs> there's smart contracts on pretty much everything. Welcome to the Protocol Podcast. I'm Brad Cowan here with my co-hosts, Margot Nykirk and Sam Kessler. We're excited to dive into today's show with the latest news and developments in technology behind crypto and blockchains. First, please do not forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Protocol, on Coindesk.com. Now, we have a guest with us today, Mike Siligadza, CEO and founder of EtherFi, which is right at the center of this exploding trend that Sam's been writing about, like, like what, five stories, I think, this week, Sam? A lot of stories. EtherFi is uh, the biggest restaking protocol, according to DeFi Llama. I just checked that. Um, anyway, welcome, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's an exciting space. Certainly a lot going on pretty much every day. Yeah, I imagine. Well, we're going to get to that. Um, and Mike's going to be our guest host, so he's going to be with us as we discuss uh, some of the hot stories of the week. The Starknet airdrop. I mean, it has just been nonstop Starknet airdrop coverage. Margo, you cover Starknet. You you know, you're our Starknet expert here. What is? Tell us, what's the latest on the Starknet airdrop? Yeah, so the Starknet airdrop went live as of February 20th. Um, this was long awaited. It was announced the week prior, um, and there was a lot of controversy around it. A lot of people who were excited about the possibility of finally claiming their Stark tokens. And, you know, the Starkware Foundation uh, claimed that this was the largest uh, airdrop eligibility criteria i believe some like 1.3 million wallet addresses were eligible to claim their stark tokens but at the same time a lot of the starknet users were sort of frustrated with this criteria for one there was one of the eligible groups was solo like ethereum solo stakers i think it made up about 22 percent the foundation had sort of come out and said that like we're doing this to sort of thank the people who are maintaining the security of the mainnet, you know, the, the base blockchain, Ethereum. Starknet is a layer two built on top of Ethereum. So that's sort of where that comes in. You know, a lot of Stark, Starknet users have sort of noted that solo stakers have a large amount of cash available to, you know, participate in the staking process. And so awarding them with more like tokens and more free money basically is adding to their bags. It's not really decentralizing the system. And on the other hand, there was another eligibility criteria where uh, you had to have 0.005 ETH in your wallet on your in your Starknet wallet on November fifteenth. I think it's I think it is the date. Um, and so there are some users who you know have participated in the Starknet ecosystem consistently throughout the you know throughout the last couple months, and because they didn't have that exact amount on that day. They also were not eligible for the airdrop. A lot of like praise and backlash for this specifically, uh, just because it depends what you know bucket you fall into. Um, but it's been really interesting to sort of follow follow that as that's unfolded. And just a quick quick glance at the market here. I mean, Shorty Amawa, our colleague, wrote about this this morning. That you know the the price of the thing came out at like five dollars per token, and now yeah. it's trading at I think a dollar eighty nine, which is a circulating market cap of uh, 1.4 billion dollars um but i mean the other thing the other controversial thing is this that they have these token unlocks that are coming uh for the team in like two months which yeah. uh sam I, you have any quick thoughts on the stark net airdrop I mean, I, I kind of want to withhold some of my thoughts until, um, you know, a, a later segment when we talk to Mike here about points and, um, you know, what they are and how projects can think about incentivizing usage patterns in a way that both satisfies users in terms of aligning their expectations with airdrops, but also moves them 
towards doing things that are in alignment with whatever that ecosystem that's airdropping tokens wants. I'm talking kind of like vaguely here and broadly, but we'll, we'll get more specific about it later. I do think though that the Starkware airdrop is another example in a long line of examples. I didn't write about this one, but of how airdrops can and almost always do go wrong. It, it's kind of hilarious. Like you saw on Solana, a bunch of airdrops that came out that actually went pretty well because they came out of nowhere. And, um, you know, all, all of a sudden people were getting free money and now we're seeing airdrops again on Ethereum. But with with without many exceptions, Solana's ecosystem being a, a slight one with a, a couple airdrops there, you always see problems. I think about the the Arbitrum, um, you know, airdrop that we saw I, I, last year, I, I forget um, how many months ago at this point, where there are problems with their distribution, um, distribution being one of the common points of contention. But you've also, you, you know, you'll have problems when e even when, well, I, I'll just stop here. <laughs> you can go through basically every single airdrop and find problems like this with it. But it does feel like the heat of, um, you know, things has been intensified with the Starkware thing, maybe because it's, you know, you know, there haven't been as many recently. Yeah, I wanted to add to that, you know, he's you, Sam, you're absolutely right. You know, with the Arbitrum airdrop, there was also a 50% decrease immediately um, in the token price. So that's not entirely unusual. There is always some sort of backlash or something goes wrong, but it's always interesting because these projects always start to claim then that, you know, things are going smoothly. Like I saw Ali Ben Sisson, he, who's the co-founder of Starkware, he tweeted out this morning that... Um, you know, there were there was no technical mishaps. I think 70% of Stark tokens have been claimed. They had, you know, I think it was like 420 million tokens are is that number specifically. So they would argue like it's going quite smoothly. Like people are interested and people are claiming them. But, you know, he was on Laura Shin's podcast last week and he wouldn't say exactly what it is that from the mistakes that they've made, what it is specifically that they've learned. So we'll, you know, we'll have to we'll we'll have to get into this. Uh, Another thing that point. he did not say was whether he would sell his token. Yeah. It is I noticed. <laughs> he but... did not do himself any favors with that podcast. <laughs> no. We kind of talked about that offline as well. But I do think that that kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, even though we see backlash almost every time one of these things happens, um, at least in this case, it seems like they weren't bracing for it like one might expect. Like yeah. even if they thought they had everything figured out, which it does seem like they did in this case, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't plan. But again, I don't know if token prices are a right proxy for whether this sentiment actually matters. Um, because it, it does seem like, you know, we're not talking about everything that happened with Arbitrum anymore. That ecosystem is doing really well. They went to like, you know, uh, over the summer, they set a bunch of records. They're still the, the the leading layer two ecosystem on Ethereum. So, you know, does this matter? I don't know, but it is worth talking about. Um, and it's something that I imagine regulators are looking at as well, because airdrops, free money, the reason why airdrops exist is because of, you know, ICOs not working before and those looking too much like IPOs. And you can't claim these in the United States for a bunch of reasons. I, I'm rambling here, but there's a lot of, you know, reasons why I, I, I think despite token prices, backlash like this might be something that founders and, and, and teams should, you know, bear in mind. Mike, what about you? Have you were you following this story pretty closely? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, you know, crypto is this uh, amazing space uh, that's almost like a bizarre land where you can give people a hundred million dollars and they find a way to complain about it because they didn't get quite enough or somebody else got more. It's uh, it's so uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of absurd. Um, uh, and you know, and, and looking at the price of the token, I think um, these things are such speculative assets. Um, I think if you think about the market cap of, uh, you know, of Starkware uh, versus uh, the market cap of, you know, let's say other companies more in the in the real world, let's say, um, it's hard to draw a comparison, right? Like how much economic value is actually being created here. Um, and so to me, like this is still like it's part of a speculative mania that's mostly just following kind of the ups and downs of the of the market. I still very much look at it as just kind of levered beta rather than something that has its own uh, own substance. Levered beta on what in this case? Uh, well, I guess on Ethereum. I mean, we see if you actually do the like the correlation between these right. assets. I mean, they're all about you know point nine. It's just the the volatility is higher in one or another. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's hard to say that there's anything really like pegging the value of uh, one token or or another relative to the project itself versus just the the entire market kind of moving up and down in, in unison. 
Is yeah. there anything, broadly speaking, that you think, um, based on what you do know and or have observed about the Starkware airdrop, that they, you know, clearly screwed up on? Um, I mean, they 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 started um, thinking about this a while ago, but yeah, yeah. I think I mean it's so hard to criticize sitting on the on the sidelines. Um, uh, I want to be careful with what I say here. I, I I tend to think that simplicity with these things is really key. Um, Anytime you try to come up with clever rules and exclusions and like curves and tranches and all that stuff, inevitably it makes things worse. Like inevitably you end up, you know, creating some sort of system that favors one group versus another. And it just creates frustrations versus going out with a really simple, let's say linear system. Um, You're still not going to make everybody happy, but at least it's so straightforward that like it's hard to argue. So if I, if I had any uh, criticisms or advice, it's that like like so many airdrops, they tried to get too cute and uh, and complex with it. He kind of owned that, you know, in terms of, I mean, not as a problem, but as a virtue, he was positioning it that they really, mm. to your point, they really tried to get creative. And it was, you know, it was non-standard um, in terms of the allocation. So... Yeah, I mean, it was we, not we, simple. We, yeah, to so your many point. many airdrops. I, basically, every single one. Alt layer was another recent, you know, big one. And uh, again, it's I don't know what the hundreds of millions of dollars given away to users. And like all you heard about was the complaining. Um, and because <laughs> right. you know, the tranche system and too much went to <laughs> NFTs, and it's just uh, it's hard to it's hard to please everybody. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. In a sense, like just a like really dumb simple system might might have been a better approach. Do you think that that says something about the airdrop model itself? Yeah, I mean, airdrops are such a weird kind of mechanism. Um, if you look at it purely from like a cost of acquisition standpoint, it makes no sense, right? You're, you're spending $100 million to acquire however many thousands of users. Uh, like the, 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 the ROI on that makes absolutely no sense. But that's not quite the right way to look at it because if you didn't do the airdrop, you wouldn't have had that those users in the first place and you wouldn't have had something that's actually worth airdropping. And so it's this weird kind of like circular reflexive kind of thing that I haven't seen a coherent model uh, around. Um, so uh, maybe the answer is it's just a bad idea and airdrops are, you know, just aren't a good model. Uh, or someone needs to come up with like a, uh, an analytical framework to understand like what what is the right way to think about these uh, these mm-hmm. things. But I haven't seen a good one. Uh, Why yeah. you got to be such a hater, Mike? <laughs> there, there's a lot about crypto that is not driven by what is the most sensible thing to do. It's driven by constraint that are constraints that are externally imposed. All right. Well, this is a fun topic. Um, let's move on. Our next story. Thank you, Mike. The, the headline of the story: Stellar starts phased rollout of Soribon smart contracts. I think I'll say Stellar is our sponsor here. So just throwing that disclosure out there, but. <laughs> Stellar is a, is pretty interesting that they're doing this. You know, they were a blockchain from, you know, 2014, a fork of Ripple, you know, payments focused. They were kind of one of the OGs predating by Ethereum by a year, you know, and now here in the year 2024, they're adding smart contracts. So they've been adding, they, they've been working on this for, for two years. Um, and it's been a huge push of, uh, of their foundation. This, this kind of OG blockchain ecosystem, half the battle in this business is just kind of getting name recognition. I think sometimes, and, you know, Stellar definitely is a name that a lot of people know, you know, uh, they're not, you know, they're nowhere on DeFi. I think they're in the, you know, I'm just looking up here on DeFi Llama. They're 55, 55th biggest DeFi because they don't really have DeFi at the moment. But, you know, I think that's the idea of bringing in smart contracts. I don't know. What do y'all think about this idea of, you know, OG chain, uh, you know, trying to spruce itself up? Mike, you want to go first on this one? <laughs> I mean, I I can't tell you the last time I looked uh, at, at Stellar. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, look, smart contracts are. I think it almost seems cliche and kind of pointless to say this, but like uh, most of the value in blockchain, I, I think, comes from smart contract platforms. I think that 
that much is clear. You know, there's smart contracts on Bitcoin now. <laughs> there's smart contracts on pretty much everything. So it makes a ton of sense that they're doing this. Uh, you know, that's that's how you kind of have to stay relevant. Um, um, historically, this is not you know like a you know you know an old protocol that's been around for a long time bolting something else on. It's that's rarely successful. Um, I hope you know for the benefit of the ecosystem. I hope that's the, that's not the case here. I hope they do really well and it's a, it's a great product. But um, it's a it's a challenging thing to do uh, to mm -hmm. sort of pivot to do kind of a hard pivot like this. I would say zooming out too. So there's a lot of ecosystems like this that we've seen. I mean, EOS to some extent, Ripple to a larger extent, that raised a bunch of money during the ICO boom of 2016, 2017. Now they have buckets and buckets of cash, like billions of dollars worth sitting in these foundations. Things work differently then. It wasn't DAOs. It's a, it's a completely different model. And at a certain point, like there are companies, there are developers working on these things, and they do kind of have to justify those, <laughs> those treasure troves um, that they, that they you know, made however many years ago. And I do think that a part of that playbook um, is frequently adding smart contracts. Um, you, you're seeing it with Ripple to to some extent, where there's some team that's working on smart contracts there. You see it here, but you know they they might make um, and, and and there I, I think there is reason, Mike, like you said to to you know it, there, there you do need smart contracts if you want to keep up, um, um, unless you're something like a Bitcoin, but Bitcoin itself even has smart contracts, and that kind of brings me to my last point here, which is the Bitcoin model, and I have a story that's, I think, going out in three minutes as of the recording of this podcast that is about smart contracts on, on Bitcoin. On that ecosystem, the whole selling point there is that there's a ton of value on Bitcoin. And so by adding smart contracts, by adding decentralized finance, by adding NFTs, they unlock that value in the most valuable blockchain to be used in all of these other ways to create all these other primitives. And I do see that being, you know, a narrative that you could apply here, which is stellar for, for even though we don't really talk about it that much on this podcast, or Mike, you might not be talking about it. There is a lot of value locked there just by virtue of how old it is. And it is like a top ranking coin on core and micro cap. So maybe the rationale is, hey, that money is locked up there. If we can do more things with it, you know, power to them. I don't have a lot more to add. I think Mike took a lot of the words out of my, my own mouth, but I agree. Like, you know, as someone that covers Ethereum, like the fact that smart contracts are coming in 2024 is like, oh, yawn, you know, like, uh, you know, <laughs> so there's all these other innovations that are happening, but I guess, you know, like you said, Stellar is this like payments focused blockchain. And so um, this is there. I mean, you know, it's great that there's more innovation, but like, smart contracts from the Ethereum perspective is at the heart of what blockchain is and blockchain tech is, you know? So uh, I guess the more the merrier. I mean, to Sam's point, they have lots of money, right? I mean, I guess maybe that is a question is if, can you, if you have all that money, can you, can you build it? Yeah. And also, but like, if you're going to go and, and, you know, use a blockchain for the purpose of using, you know, smart contracts, are you going to go to Stellar? I don't know. There's a, there's a long list of other blockchains. Maybe you go first too. Yeah, I think but. this kind of thing, it always comes down to the team. And I, I, I'll admit, I don't know the Stellar team at all. Um, if they can deliver, if they can execute, if they can, you know, set up the right BD relationships and like get the right developer ecosystem going, if they can attract, you know, uh, good, good engineers, uh, this could work. It, it all comes down to the team. I mean, the, um, Smart contract tech is something that's it's just it's existed for a long time now. Uh, it's it's pretty well understood what the table stakes are. I mean, I don't know if there's some special twist on it, you know, in this case, but it's pretty just well understood. Um, so it really just comes down to execution um, and will they be able to do it? I think that's uh, that's entirely up to the team. I mean, Stellar, they do have a pretty you know, vibrant community in terms of, I don't know if it's as rabid as like the, you know, the XRP uh, army or whatever, but it's, you know, they, they have, you know, a pretty well attended conference that there's always a lot of, you know, cheering and stuff. I think, well, I, I think that but... there's like different kinds of communities, right? There's like on Ripple, you have a big investor community, a lot of people who hold their XRP bags 
And so that is a community in some sense. On Ethereum, um, you have a, a larger, I would say, developer community. They do have a big investor community, but they also have a very large developer community of people who are building things. And that comes as a result of smart contracts. So if you're adding smart contracts to your ecosystem, maybe you can expand that community to include all of those engineers who are building things on top of the chain. I know that's one of the rationales that um, we were given by um, the CTO of Ripple um, recently uh, as for why they're adding smart contracts. It can help expand that net. But when we talk about community, um, I don't know if there's overlap between their existing community and the kind of community that they'd need to cultivate or would want to cultivate with smart contracts. There's like a spectrum, uh, to use an imperfect analogy of like, on the one hand, you have Cosmos, where there's like the, some of the best engineers in the it's world are working engineers. on that. It's the coolest tech ever. <laughs> Zero investors, nobody seems to care about it as far as a financial <laughs> thing. But like probably the most interesting technology. And then on the other hand, yeah, whether whether it's like, uh, you know, Stellar or whatever, uh, there are more communities that are just entirely financially driven. Um, and then Ethereum is probably somewhere in, in between. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you have to you have to move more closer to Cosmos if you actually want to create real value, lasting value in, in a smart contract platform. Mm. Interesting. All right. Well. Let us go to the break here, uh, and when we come back, we're going to be talking to Mike about uh, his wheelhouse of uh, of liquid restaking, uh, which is just blowing up, and we're uh, pretty lucky to have him. All right, let's go to the break. Calling all developers. Score a consensus 2024 developer pass for just $109, but act fast. Only a limited number of these passes are available. You may have heard that Consensus ain't for devs, but here's why you're wrong. Consensus is the only place you can fully immerse yourself in a multi-chain environment and learn directly from 20 plus chains, including Arbitrum, Chainlink, Solana, and more. Enjoy three days of intensive learning with technical talks, 40 plus expert speakers, and 20 plus in-depth workshops, including dedicated half days for Ethereum and Bitcoin and three full days of programming on our Protocol Village stage. Consensus 2024 is happening May 29th through 31st in Austin, Texas. Don't miss your chance to network at curated developer meetups, find new career opportunities, and explore hundreds of side events and hacker houses around town. Grab your $109 developer pass today, but remember this exclusive offer is limited. Visit consensus.coindesk.com now to secure your developer pass before they're gone. Explore the epicenter of blockchain innovation at Consensus 2024. All right. Welcome back. Uh, we're here with Mike Siligadza. Um, super lucky to have the CEO of EtherFi, the leading uh, liquid restaking protocol. And uh, I think I'm going to turn it over here to Sam, uh, who has quickly become our expert on liquid restaking. Uh, how many stories this week have you written? Several. 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 Like, okay. Yeah. I don't think it was five, um, but like several. Uh, so Sam, why don't you lead this discussion? I'm going to move over to Mike here because I think he'll be able to give an explanation of, you know, what this is. But at a high level, um, we saw in June the the launch um, in, in, you know, to some extent of something called Eigenlayer, which is a restaking platform on Ethereum that essentially lets you share Ethereum security with other networks. If you staked, you know, Ethereum on um, or uh, staked Ether with Ethereum to keep the network secure. The value add here is now you can stake it or restake it instead with Eigenlayer to spread that security to other so-called AVSs, actively validated services. But there's this new thing, um, which is called liquid restaking, which does something similar to what Lido did on Ether Ethereum staking, where it added liquidity. But I'm going to ask maybe, Mike, you can kind of talk to us about how these two things sort of connect. And then we'll talk about all the crazy billions of dollars we've seen flowing into this ecosystem recently. Yeah, so the um, I think it's worth saying that restaking is something that emerges very naturally out of proof of stake. As soon as you have a proof of stake blockchain, uh, like like Ethereum, uh, restaking just is like really a logical next step that uh, comes out of that. Uh, one 
kind of abstract, but I think helpful way to, to think about it is staking is driven by slashing conditions within Ethereum, meaning when you stake your ETH, you're you know, accepting the responsibility of operating a validator and opting into slashing conditions. But those slashing conditions are fixed on Ethereum and restaking basically makes those slashing conditions programmable. So now you can say, well, okay, now I'm going to be opting into the slashing conditions of this other network and this other service and so on and so forth in exchange for fees in the same way that you get fees for opting into the slashing conditions of Ethereum. And so that's an inter interesting and important analogy because in the same way that Ethereum is a natural extension of Bitcoin, where Bitcoin has Bitcoin script, which is a very limited programming language, and Ethereum makes that fully programmable, which is where smart contracts come in. Proof of stake or restaking, I should say, is a natural extension where it makes those slashing conditions on Ethereum programmable. So it really is kind of, uh, there's no way to avoid it. Like this was going to happen no matter what. Like this proof of stake, uh, it just it inherently leads to restaking. Um, um, in some ways, it's surprising that it's taken this long uh, to, to emerge. And part of that, I think, is the, um, the meme, the narrative of putting a word on it, like restaking and defining it and like, putting a theoretical framework around it, as, as Sriram and, and his team at Eigenlayer have done. Um, that's what really triggered all the excitement, but it, 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 it is sort of the, this inevitable uh, kind, of, uh, kind of thing. Um, and uh, I use the analogy of Bitcoin to Ethereum um, uh, deliberately because I really think it's a big deal. Like this is, there, there is a lot of hype uh, around it, but in the same way that moving from sort of static Bitcoin to more dynamic and programmable Ethereum was a really big deal that unlocked a huge amount of uh, value creation and, uh, and ability to build products around it. I think making Ethereum like meta programmable in a sense, uh, similarly unlocks a tremendous amount of, uh, of value. There's a lot of potential here. Um, however, that potential is entirely unrealized now. It is entirely speculative because there are no restaking services, none, mm -hmm. zero. There's no restaking services live but there's six or seven billion or whatever the number is inside of Eigenlayer, you know, and inside of restaking protocols like uh, like us, um, which is uh, crazy when you think about it. Like there's, this is a huge amount of money flowing into things that is completely like uh, roadmap uh, driven. Um, so that's, uh, I think people are reasonably excited about it, um, but there's a lot of unrealized uh, potential. here. So, okay, going back to EtherFi. Yeah. EtherFi is, you can think of it, I think a better way to think about EtherFi is just as a next generation staking protocol. In the same way that you had Lido and Rocket Pool as the first gen of staking protocols, EtherFi is really just a next generation of that. So I, I don't even like the distinction between like liquid restaking versus liquid staking because really like all staking is going to have restaking built in. There's, it's not going to make any sense to just do vanilla staking. All staking is going to be restaked automatically. Um, and so really, this is just a natural next step of what staking uh, looks like. And so it operates from a user standpoint exactly the same way as, you know, people have been used to, which is, you know, instead of locking up your ETH uh, in order to stake it, uh, you have now a liquid receipt token that you can use in DeFi. And that's what EtherFi gives you. You go to Ether.Fi, put in your ETH, mint your ETH liquid restaking token, uh, and then use it in dozens and dozens of different DeFi protocols to do all the normal things that you'd expect to be able to do, like borrow against it, take leverage, trade, and do all kinds of fun and interesting things that DeFi allows you to do. So maybe to talk a little bit about what the incentives are. So, you know, um, we, we went over a lot there, but um, just to like remind listeners, like at a high level, the whole point of Eigenlayer from an investor standpoint is that now, instead of just earning staking interest, you earn restaking interest, which is extra interest you get for helping to secure these AVSs that you're now securing with your Ether, your Ether tokens on top of the Ethereum network. But um, even though I, I was kind of like cagey about whether Eigenlayer has launched, even though Eigenlayer has launched, um, Eigenlayer has not launched, or, or rather it hasn't opened up the ability for these AVSs to, to, to launch. So the interest that is rewarded, um, you know, it isn't really happening yet. So can you talk a little bit about why people are putting money into this system now? What are the rewards? That, that's exactly right. It has not, the AVSs have not been turned on. Um, the first AVS is EigenDA, which is built by Eigenlayer. And then there's a whole constellation of really crazy and interesting projects that are in flight, and none of them are, are live yet. Um, uh, so, why, yeah, so why are people putting in, 
Uh, they're, they're seven ETH. billion well, dollars of ETH. I should yeah, say seven billion dollars of ETH. Uh, and the answer is points. Uh, you may have seen, you know, the meme and, and meta around points floating around the the Twitter sphere or X sphere. That doesn't sound as good. Yeah. Um, the you know the 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 universe of uh, social media around uh, around crypto. Um, and uh, there's, I would say, a mixed bag of some people love the new crazy points uh, games uh, that are going on, and some people are just sick of it and just give me the tokens and, and emissions. So, uh, but that's what people are doing. They're farming points in and all what kinds are, of what crazy. Are points? And, so that yeah, that's so they're, the obvious um, question. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to be somewhat careful with what you can also read with. Sam's story this morning on coindesk.com. Ah, I my, 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 so maybe for context, if you put money, um, for, for our listeners again, like we're, we're talking in the weeds, but if you put yeah. money, um, deposit it into EtherFi, which is yeah. one of these liquid restaking protocols, the biggest one with over a billion dollars, I believe you were the first launch or the, the first we major were, one yeah. to launch. Yeah. Um, you get in return, ultimately, you're going to get this token that earns interest, this EE token that earns interest mm -hmm. from ABSs. But right now, you get points. You get eigenlayer points, and then you get EtherFi points. Um, right. So what are the points? That's that's where we're at in the yeah, conversation Yeah, exactly. Now. So you, you are getting staking rewards. So it's uh, these days, it's the equivalent of the staking rewards would be equivalent of 3.5% uh, interest, which is the same as you'd get in any staking protocol, pretty much. Um, uh, so you're getting your staking rewards. Eventually, you'll get your restaking rewards. But right now, you're getting staking rewards plus points, Etherite points and, and Eigenlayer points. Um, uh, these points are basically a representation of how much you've contributed to the protocol. That's that's what they're for. Um, and people are buying them. They're selling them. They're levering them up. Oh, that's what you're about yeah. to talk about with the speculation. Yeah. So they uh, people are doing all kinds of... I'm happy to talk about some examples of crazy things that people yeah. are doing with their their points, um, but um, it, no one, including us, is allowed to talk about anything. What the value might be from those points? Why, so why I don't know what they're going to be. Like, what is allowed? Just, mean? That's like as a journalist, what we're <laughs> curious and because everybody's so cagey. I just talked to Puffer yesterday too. Yeah, um, they're one of your competitors. I don't know if you are all also cagey about what is a competitor, but um, yeah, what. Yeah, what what is all the sensitivity around? Because a lot of people expect well, that they're attracted, you cannot, they're tied points, to airdrops. We, we're accepting no obligation for what points may or may, may not turn into. Uh, they are simply a, a fun, gamified way, just like you. Uh, it's even less direct than like when you use a credit card, you get some loyalty points. Um, we're not committing uh, or, or communicating anything about what those points might turn into. Uh, then why just, have them? That's the obvious next question. Um, Not to put you on the hot seat, but no. I mean, well, yeah. they, they are a representation of how much a user has contributed to the the protocol, um, uh, and we have communicated that they may have some value in the future, but we're not committing to anything specific. And yeah, you, you have to be pretty careful uh, with that. Um, yeah. Uh, some of the things that people are doing with these points, I mean, it's gotten really crazy so just today or yesterday it, you know it, it's it's happening pretty fast yeah there's there's a market that opened up Help for down. ether five points um, yeah. where people can now buy and oh, sell them I, I don't even know exactly how that works but that's, and that's so you had thing. nothing to do with that so people just did it yeah of course yeah no it's it is uh we put out the protocol the protocol right. Ascribes points to wallets. This. Yeah. Uh, somehow, I, I don't. I literally don't even know how exactly they do this, but somehow they're, you know, they're allowing people to to swap these points uh, back so and forth. As um, a founder, are you concerned about that? Like, you've got yeah, Pendo, sure. which is levered. Yeah. So can you kind of? Because I imagine you guys are building like a very real thing with all this anti slashing and like all this stuff. How do you communicate to users? Hey, this thing's going to have value, but it doesn't have any value, and yeah. be careful, don't lever it up. But it will have value, so maybe you should. Well, people it. are levering it up. Uh, people are uh, uh, 10, 20 x leverage. Uh, Gearbox recently released a thing where, and this it's, so Pendo is a model that a lot of people have started sort of, uh, I guess, replicating and doing versions. Of. And Pendo is honestly one of the coolest protocols on Ethereum. I would say I'll, I'll, give, I'll give them. That's a the point. lever where you can get these point leverage just for. Well, it's actually listening. it's more subtle and interesting. It, it leads to effectively being able to lever up on points. But the way it actually works is it is an interest rate trading protocol. So it, you, you put in on the input of Pendo is you put in an interest bearing asset. In, in this case, it's a liquid staking token, but it could be anything. It could be a stable coin, could be a liquidity pool, could be anything. You, you're putting in an interest yield bearing asset. And what Pendo does is split it into two tokens. 
the principal token, which is a fixed value, uh, and then the yield token. And normally, if you have something that's yielding a fixed, you know, 3%, there's a very well-defined parameter there. The, the principal token is going to be worth less because it's discounted by the, the yield. And the yield token is going to be worth whatever the yield is. In this case, the yield token also holds the points. And so uh, there's a lot of speculation about what these things are going to be worth. Is there some value ascribed to them? And people are going, so it allows you to lever up on points because you can, as a user, come in and just say, okay, I'm just going to buy the yield token and I'm going to bid it up because I think the points are going to be really valuable. And so users have bid up these points tokens, the yield mm -hmm. token, to uh, a completely unhinged degree. I, I will I'll fully say that it's just gotten absolutely crazy. And the net effect of that is on the, on the other side, you have users that are able to lock in effectively a fixed interest rate on their pick principal token. Uh, as high as 40% in some case, annualized interest rate for you know three months, six months, um, because people are speculating on the value of these uh, of these points. Uh, so uh, nobody could have predicted how big this would have gotten. I mean, it's up to now, I think over well over $300 million, maybe even $400 million in these like various, uh, you know, crazy instruments. Um, uh, we certainly had no idea that it was that it was going to be this big. Uh, when we saw when we did the partnership with uh, with Pendo, um, uh, it, I think it's exceeded everyone's expectations. Even I mean, th this goes all the way to Eigenlayer too. I, I don't think they, uh, uh, I, I know this fairly confidently. They they definitely didn't think they would get seven billion dollars of ETH deposited uh, into their protocol before launch. What um, were yeah. they expecting? I, I don't know what number they had. I'll, I'll tell you what number we had in our head in terms of our targets. Um, we were targeting uh, 100k stake teeth, which today would be, I guess, around uh, you know 280 million dollars or whatever, maybe 290 so, million dollars. Yeah, by just the end do of the March, math. That's a lot less. That's for, yeah, for by ether the end of March, seven billion. We were that's saying for, for Etherfi, for Etherfi, yeah, for Etherfi. We, th we thought yeah. we'd feel so good if oh, we got billion, 100k yeah. ETH by the end of March. Uh, we hit 100k ETH by January 18th, and we're now at 475k ETH. So, so it's just, it's completely gone. Yeah, it's gone bonkers. Uh, we feel humbled and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's been amazing to watch the, the amount of excitement people have for this thing. Why do you think it's gone bonkers though? Because there's always a lot of like fad, not fad. I know it gets confused, um, confusion here, but like there's a lot of fad, like, you know, or craze in uh, like crypto trends and, you know, points, airdrops, that's sort of like at the heart of a lot of this. So I sort of want to understand why you think this has exploded and like whether we think this is persistent, right? Because there's um, a skyrocketing of interest, but will it slow down? You know, first, what, yeah, where, first where is this? Down. Yeah, no, it's, there's, de there's definitely going to be a crunch. Like I, 100% <laughs> there's going to be a trough of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's impossible for it to meet yeah. Like it's too high. There's no way to meet this expectation. That's so what set. are you guys doing to prepare for that? Like, you know, uh, yeah, that's a great, let me answer the question. Cause I do think it's an interesting and important question. Like crypto is this, uh, very free, unrestricted, hyper speculative market. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was the money printer got turned on again, but right. the U S basically the Fed, the money printer is back on. And so everything is going crazy. The S and P is going crazy now. I mean, everything is going up now. It's this is crypto is levered beta. They said that earlier. You know, it, it's the same thing. It's just it, it's the money printers back on. Therefore, everything is just getting pumped to to infinity. And it just happened to be that restaking just was this like really powerful yeah. idea that is correct and valid and will be a, a huge source of value creation in in, in over the long term. But it became this focal point where it just like all of the speculation and craziness just got focused on this one particular space and just everyone is, you know, and the more crazy it gets, the, the higher the expectation for what Eigenlayer's, you know, uh, token is, is going to be at, mm -hmm. which becomes this, you know, self-perpetuating, you know, fuel cycle. Um, what we're trying to do is A, uh, create enough scale with EtherFi that we become this Lindy protocol that... A has value as a staking and restaking platform, but B is just a good way to hold uh, to have long exposure to ETH. If mm -hmm. you want to be long ETH, we want to be a trusted brand that has all this great functionality, is integrated with every single DeFi protocol. It's going to be on every exchange. It's just going to be everywhere. 
And so we want to be a great way for users to hold ETH and get exposure to DeFi. Um, and the plan is to roll out a suite of products over time um, that uh, beyond just staking, so integrated products uh, over time that, uh, that again, create real value for users in terms of making their life easier and navigating the complexities of DeFi. So even if it takes years, which is probably how long it will take for the, the reality of restaking to catch up to the craziness around it, um, you know, we, we hope to continue to build really good products that uh, make lives easier uh, over that entire period. Mike, I'd like to hear, you know, here we are in early 2024 and all of a sudden there's, you know, 470 ETH in your protocol. You know, I mean, just to back up, you know, Sriram, uh, as you know, as you mentioned, is sort of credited with with eigenlayer and this idea of restaking but when did you get get the idea of doing the restaking protocol on top of eigenlayer like how, yeah, how did, what was that timing like we you know it, it, it's a great question and i think back at how it just I, honestly i think lucky uh we we got in a sense that we um uh we looked at the staking universe and saw an opportunity to build a next generation staking protocol. And when was and that? This was last year in around oh, uh, just last actually year. January, December of 22, January 23 was around the time when we were really thinking about this. Okay. And we had seen, we saw these at the time, all there was, was uh, some interesting YouTube lectures by this like uh, clearly very smart professor named Sriram. Uh, talking about this concept of restaking, uh, and for me, it was it was a bit of an aha moment, in the, similar to the moment when I first read about Bitcoin or first read about Ethereum, where it was just this moment of clarity that this is this is going to be the future of Ethereum. It was just like it was crystal clear in that in that same way, and so we had made the decision to like really bet everything to build a staking protocol that, like at the core of it, had restaking baked into it. So, um, this was a pretty major. Uh, Bet. And it seemed like it was very speculative at the time because we we sort of said, well, look, this is still a very niche thing. No one's really like talking about it. Um, um, and it just it the I think there was a lot of luck associated with it, but um, it ended up being more right than we ever could have anticipated. Like the amount of excitement around it ended up being uh, far more right than we thought. And we just because we had been working, we were the first ones to start working on it, so we were the first ones to launch. And so the timing just worked out that everything exploded, and now we have a billion and a half dollars in the protocol in the span of you know four months. Um, so it's just yeah, it it, it it ended up being quite quite crazy. Maybe I'll ask one more question to just close things up to kind of go back to the points, which is what's kind of like kicked off this entire speculative frenzy that we were talking about. Obviously, if you don't issue points, you're kind of dead mm -hmm. in the water at this point. Everybody's issuing points. Yeah, and... I guess. That's so probably to. true at this point. Yeah. And, I think. and so I wonder, like, concretely, I, I, I kind of asked this question before, and maybe I'm forgetting, or maybe we didn't get a full answer. But like, and I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot on this, <laughs> but why can't we talk about what, like, why can't you just come out and say, hey, points are or are not tied to a future airdrop? Because you could also say there is no airdrop. That's something that you saw on other ecosystems as well in mm -hmm. separate trends. So, and we've said that yeah. for ourselves multiple times. There's no, we, we haven't talked about any kind of airdrop. But you um, haven't said there's no airdrop. Like you said. We have, that, actually, we have. Oh, no, you we, have? We, yeah, we, we, we said That's there's news no, to me. we've confirmed nothing. There's no, we're not promising or saying anything about an airdrop uh, that's that's coming. Okay. I mean, um, first of all, I will say we, we definitely do not get the blame for the points uh, thing. We started our points back, uh, you know, in February, I think February, March of last year. But like Blur was the one that really kicked this whole thing off. Uh, if I could put blame uh, on points fatigue uh, yeah. for, for users, I definitely I pointed straight at uh, Blur. I think we yeah. we just happened to be uh, <laughs> doing it at the same time. Um, uh, yeah, look, I, you have to be very careful with these uh, token launches. Um, you know, there was a lot of um, bad behavior when it came to the ICO mania of, uh, you know, a few years back. Um, and so you just have to be careful with how you launch these things. And you, you, you have to be careful in terms of not uh, uh, offering anything, not creating any kind of offering to retail and being very careful to 
in our case in particular to um, avoid U.S. customers. So we we mm-hmm. actually in our terms of service, uh, we you know block U.S. customers. Uh, users have to sign a transaction saying they're not a U.S. person. Um, and geofence, we do we take all kinds of measures to uh, to avoid it. But that's really what it comes down to: is you want to we want to be compliant in every way that we can. Um, and so that's part of it: is you you have to be very careful not to make any promises or uh, insinuations around uh, what may or may not not happen with the token launch. Gotcha. This topic is not going away. I have a feeling. Um, and I hope, Mike, you'll be back at some point. Uh, hopefully we won't have to wait for that trough of disillusionment <laughs> before you come back. But anyway, thank you, Mike, for joining us. We're going to wrap here. That's it for this week. Shout out to our producer, Michelle Musso, and our booker, Mel Montañas. Uh, thank you for listening to the Protocol Podcast. If you have any questions about any stories or comments, please reach out to us at podcasts at coindesk.com, subject line, The Protocol. Listen to us weekly on Coindesk Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please, 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 please do not forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Protocol, on coindesk.com. See you next week.